Grazie mille per essere tornati qui al Laboratorio di Pratiche Sociali che ricordiamo in parte del programma eh, Laboratori dal Basso e siamo tornati con Joe Rubin che è stato con noi eh, anche ieri pomeriggio e che oggi riprende il filo del discorso iniziato ieri e diciamo sono stato tutta una serie di suoi progetti e di suoi lavori che hanno molto a che fare con il tema della sostenibilità eh, tramite le pratiche sociali Oggi andremo un po' più a fondo e cercheremo di attivare un dialogo rispetto alla sua pratica e al, al, al contesto, alla pratica in contesti specifici. Quindi se avete voglia di, di parlare della vostra esperienza rispetto al contesto pugliese o all'interno del contesto di cui, in cui lavorate, insomma, sentitevi liberi di, di intervenire. Di, insomma, participate in conversation. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thanks for being here. So I have different stuff I wanted to show to talk about social engagement and I know that the two of you guys are already involved in that and maybe other people watching might be and we can have a much more open conversation than yesterday. Um I don't know if you want me to uh, yeah go to um Do you want me to go back and, and show a few pieces of mine and then yeah, talk of a couple, just maybe that are pertinent to dis issues we discussed. But then I want to talk about, you know, some other things. And s one subject is this idea of like using any means necessary or the simplest means necessary. Or I don't know if there's a phrase in Italian that is similar to necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah? So, <coughs> so um, and I think especially in discussions I've been having about the scene in Bari or the scenes in Italy and the idea of a very top-down structure is how, how do you, and you guys have already done this, but how do you construct uh, a place in the public realm for art when the the means are very little and you have to find a way around things so the topic is sort of uh hacking culture you know like we hack technology but hacking culture and also the idea of a loophole 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 is a um is a a way around if there's a rule it's a way of breaking the rule with kind of out breaking the rule. It's like we were talking about Berlusconi ha always has ways of getting around going to jail. Those are loopholes that he finds in the system. Yeah, exactly. It's a longer conversation. Um, so I will how to find as a pre as an artistic method. Yeah, see. L-O-O-P, like a, a loop and a hole. <laughs> H O L E loophole. Ah, like the, uh it's the name of the uh so let's see. I'll briefly show you this project and um this is an ongoing project in the city I live in in Pittsburgh. It's called Conflict Kitchen and it's an artwork in the form of a restaurant that's open seven days a week that only sells food from countries the United States is in conflict with Afghanistan, Iran, Cuba, Venezuela on a rotating basis. Yeah. So, um and it's funny so some of the I could talk <laughs> a little more detail but one of the uh I won't show the video but So this is the street corner in the neighborhood. I also took over the billboard the advertising company left the billboard and I convinced the owner to give it to me and I made a system of wooden letters that on rails um, f at first it was for ideas that things that were just happening very banal within the building like things we wanted we wanted a leafy plant we wanted talk show hosts for this project we wanted $75,000 we wanted some bu light bulbs and we would there's so many cars going by people would actually call and say ah I have a plant that you want. And it was like the idea of a, a billboard for one business. But the Conflict Kitchen is on the right. Sorry, because I've been reading uh, through Facebook. Uh, yes. Yeah. 
there was like a, a post about w w w waffle shop. The waffle shop, okay. Yeah, what is it about? Sorry. So the waffle shop is is a restaurant as well. It's, okay. It started. Um, it's a, you know waffles. It serves breakfast food. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the waffle shop was a strategy to bring a very diverse public into a situation in which they were asked then to be on a, a talk show. Yeah. And in, so in the back of the restaurant was the talk show, and we had two video cameras shooting it at all times and streaming it on the Internet. And any customer who walked in the door could be on the talk show. So if you walk in, you're a guest. Um, and the idea of this was to bring together people who might not normally be communicating with each other from different culture, from different class, from different economic um, backgrounds. Also far from the art, uh, yeah, no. Kind of Any kind of person, yeah, because this is in the middle of the city. Most people don't. Which Pittsburgh, yeah. So people who wouldn't show up to an art gallery are showing up to this restaurant um, and anyone can be on. Anything they want, yeah. So it's, this is, sometimes people would want to host a show, this man, he called himself Old Man Louie <laughs> and he's an old man who wears a mask of an old man. This is his like persona. And he would do interviews as this persona. Uh, so lots of people would kind of play with, you know, their identity a bit when they were hosting a show. So you, you were not uh, like a kind of managing or controlling? Not too much. A little bit, but not too much. If, if you came in and you said, I want to do a show in which I, I'm up on my underwear and I interview people, you know, and I look like I'm naked. I'm like, okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's we would try anything. Um, this is a show. Uh, uh, well, this is a, some video. Of it shows the various products. But it goes on Friday and Saturday night from 11 p.m. until 3 a.m. in the morning. And we're next door to a music nightclub. So people come in. It's hip-hop. So there's all different types of people coming in. They're drunk, which helps, right? Because people are willing to talk more. Um, but... And then we're also open during the day, Saturday and Sunday. Me, just director. Yeah, so you know, I have to organize everything: the the staff, the camera people, the cooks, the waiters. The project lasted for four years. Yeah, so it's not just a, a weekend; it's a project that became part of the city. You know, you would come to town, and people would say, "Ah, oh, have you heard about the waffle shop? You got to come visit." Yeah. So one of the things, some of these projects have the the amount of time that they exist within a culture or a city is important to the story that they tell. Uh, and some projects are very quick. So this led to, um, out of the same kitchen that the waffle shop, we developed the conflict kitchen. And one of the loopholes that we used, a legal strategy, was we put this big wooden structure on the outside of the building, which is illegal. But if you lift it off the ground, if you notice the structure just floats off the ground, it doesn't hit the ground, you can get away with not having to get a permit from the city. Yeah. And then um, if you go out, if the building goes out into the public right away where people walk, um, you have to get a permit. So the way this works is the the awning and the little tables on the side, they fold out, and when we close, they fold down, so we didn't have to get a permit. So in some ways, this is a way, as an artist, rather than waiting a year to get the city to approve permits and spend a bunch of money, we just the architect we worked with figured out a structure around the permits. And, you know, to me, that's one of the capacities that artists use. Um, so very basically, we, we cook food with people who are local, you know, to that culture. So we started out with an Iranian version, focusing on Iranian culture, introducing people in Pittsburgh, the United States, who, you know, were they selling this food? They're selling the food, selling it. It's a full business, real business, yeah. 
and the food comes wrapped in um, in wrappers that have interviews we did with people in Iran. No, it's legal to sell food. Yeah, ah, it is legal. that was legal. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. We take money. The money. I'm thinking about something similar. Sure. So I, I, I get the point of the strategy. That's why. Yeah. I, of course, it changed because you got different laws. Yeah. And, uh, it's different context. But yeah. I, I like the idea of uh, the structure of these uh, panels. And what it seems that here it's very difficult to sell food. Yeah. yeah. That's why you have to get permits. And yeah, and also all the the kitchen. Yeah. You have to be you have to, to have a exactly type of a fridge certificate. Yeah, we do too. We do too. So, but in my city, we actually for the first year and a half, we didn't have one, and no, one, we just basically there's a you know the uh, the phrase ask for forgiveness instead of permission. <laughs> So we we didn't have a license to make food, but we sold it until we got going, and then it was popular enough that we made enough money that we could then buy the elements of the kitchen to make it legal, and then we got the certificate. Um, and then yeah, so then we we it's a health certificate. Um, yeah. Me, I guess. <laughs> kind of uh, challenge, you know? Yeah. Like, okay, I'm gonna do, if something happens, I'm, I'm gonna sort it out. Right, the, the problem is if, if I had to come up with a business plan yeah, and exactly. money, and you know, I wouldn't have been able to try ideas out, it would have been, you know, like any other business, it would have been, you know, very difficult. Starting it very slowly, you know, try, you know, selling very like one waffle with a waffle iron in the back room on a table, like a table like this, you know, making waffles um, in the back. No, everyone thought we had a kitchen, but we just had a table with a waffle iron. And, um, you know, we built it to look like a restaurant, but it was in some ways, hey, ciao. Uh, in, some, in some ways, it was just make believe, you know, in the beginning. Uh, no, this the Comfort Kitchen. Yes, yeah, okay. the waffle shop was for four years and it closed last year. And how, did the, how did it affect the local community? Quite I a mean, bit. What was the responses from? Yeah, I mean we. <coughs> excuse me. We had over ten thousand people in four years who were just on stage. That means maybe only twenty, thirty percent of the people would go onto the stage. That means there's another seventy percent of the people who would just come and eat and watch so you know it was like like any other cafe in the city but obviously it was different because people could come and have their voice heard um, or perform with each other or to me the important part of it was that it it felt like it was constantly being remade every time by the group of people that were in the room so, uh, you know, depending if, you know, us five would make a very different show than the next five people. And, um, and I think people appreciated that. S some people came just to be on the show. Some people had came in to the restaurant because the restaurant, when you saw the front of the restaurant, it just said waffle shop. You, d <laughs> you, d you just thought it was a restaurant. And then when you walk in, you see that there's a talk show in the back. I mean, you could look through the windows and kind of see it. But it was, um, I see. so you could kind of look through those windows. This is not a very good picture. And uh, what about uh, the, um, the art uh, community in Pittsburgh? What was the response by that? Uh, I think they were interested in it, you know, but it wasn't really for them. It was just for anybody. So, you know, art, sometimes local artists or musicians would come and say, can I perform my music? Or an artist would say, could I hang my artwork? And we're like, no, because this is not an art gallery. This is a, the, the, the project is the artwork 
and the content is the people who walk in from the street. It's not the content of artists. So, right, the producers, we wanted to make a situation that was very democratic where, you know, who is producing is not a specialist or an artist. Not about, well, in some ways it is. I mean, it's about, a, a, you know, an exhibition of performance. For me, I'm very interested in performance, but I'm not interested in performance art, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like performance art, like the history of performance art, wh which I understand it, but it's, it's usually, um, you know, it's, it's for the art world. And I'm interested in kind of, I'm very curious about how amateurs, how we function as, a, not we, artists and non-artists, spontaneous action because you love something or it's a hobby or it's a fascination or it's a uh, obsession and you do it for that, not because you're chosen as an artist and you're given a certain cultural capital and therefore what you say is more important than what someone else says. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm an artist in this project, but what the frame that I'm constructing for what happens within it is my work. But what happens, you know, in in this project, very particular, is thinking about, you know, that there's this kind of uh, <sighs> what how to say um, all the time. If you opened up er all of our heads you could curate a whole world, anyone's head, <laughs> the thoughts that are running through your head. And uh, rather, and this to me is a very important thing to make work wherever I happen to be. Ver when I was in school, this was a strategy I developed and it was the simplest, it was what is in front of me. And, you know, it's like, it's the fish market, you know, or it's the Chinese immigrants. It's the things that are around you in your life are just as important as, I don't know, you know, things that are important, you know. So, and my, the question is how can I give access to that thinking to other people as well? You know, how can we share in the construction of uh, stories together? And this is not new. I mean, this is just the way in which I do it in each instance. Um, the the conflict kitchen is a little more different because it's more about what is missing from Pittsburgh in terms of culture and discussion of politics and what is missing from the United States, which is a critical reflection. Um, and it's about positioning the local within the global. So the simultaneous recognizing uh, what's in front of us is both you know, the fish market and the Chinese immigrants, but it's also our relationship to the, our, uh, to a global world, right? We're, we're connected in such a different capacity. Since it's like you start from the local to question the national, <laughs> and of course, American national means. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but it, you know, it's, only, it's, it's like, uh, you know, there's Russian, nesting dolls, the doll inside the doll inside the doll inside the doll. Building up this restaurants concerning these countries that are fighting with the America, United States. So you said Iran? So yeah, Iran, Afghanistan. So it changes entirely every six, every five to six months. Afghanistan, uh, Venezuela. Venezuela, yeah. yeah, which is not a military conflict, but yeah, a, yeah. a ideological. Yeah, uh, Cuba. Cuba. So we go to the country in uh, North Korea. Can be a very long road. It's true. It, it depends on with, from what perspectives you you mean the. It the can conflict. go very long. <laughs> yeah, Syria, the Congo. Palestine, so we're going, to, we're doing a Palestine um, version and a North Korea. So last month we went to South Korea and spent a week uh, cooking and interviewing North Korean defectors. And so... Like from Iran, uh, Iranian people or uh, Korean 
uh, how, what was their response to this project? They're very excited we're yeah. doing it. Yeah, yeah. And the people, so one of the other things that happens, this is very interesting. So when we, um, when we put up, you know, Cocina Cubana, all of the Cubans who live in Pittsburgh come out. So we'll, you know, we try to identify Cubans who are living in the city, but when you put, or you put up Farsi, you know, uh, Iranian Farsi letters, Persians are driving off the side of the road. And no, oh, okay. no. So was like the first. The first. The only, only Persian restaurant ever in Pittsburgh, the only Afghan. So it's kind of like a beacon. When we put the restaurant up, it becomes a beacon to that community to come, to work with us, to do events with us, to participate, you know, in what we're doing. Also for, obviously, people who have never been to Iran, for people who don't even, they think Iran, Iranians, like, you know, they ride camels on the desert or something. They have, this is not uncommon, you know. Americans don't go very far <laughs> most of the time. Perfect topics to make this happen. Like the food, it's always yeah. related about relations and si. enjoying. Si. And we talk about how it's non ideological. Food is food. Okay, yeah. And it goes past your intellect. The other the other aspect of uh of food and we talked about this yesterday is that it allows uh the customer to support the art project. So it creates an economic engine that allows us to be autonomous from institutions, right? So it's a strategy, which is something I think want to talk about today is kind of strategies that um, artists who are always living on the edges of, importantly on the edges, can have economically, because it's very, I mean, I, you have to talk about economics, you know, yeah. And... Uh, uh, no. <laughs> the speech of the swans. Um, so, video documentation. Um, we have some. Let's see. Of this, yeah, the video. I mean, like, there's. Let me show you. Uh, the video we usually show people is the uh, the video of the the media. Oh, this is the speech of the swans. It's, uh, I mean, I talked about it all yesterday, but yeah, basically, uh, just in Bra this is in Brazil. The public is invited to take a ride with Hugo Chavez or Barack Obama, like a romantic ride. And during the ride, they do an interview, and the, and the president say, what do you think of me, like a, a lover? And then you s give your opinions, and then those opinions are turned into speeches. And the speeches are given to the public so it's g giving voice to the Brazilian public through these uh, presidents uh, and switching of the power dynamics, right, between the, the public. No, they were already in the park. This is the other strategy that I use all the time is to place the work where people already are going, systems that are already very um, part of the public, and just insert the work into those systems. Practice, of course, it's mainly related to the process, to the relation. But there's also, I mean, that's what my perception. There's also a visual aspect, oh, very, very. which is important. Yes. And yeah, it's very that's visual. Why I was asking you, how did you? I mean, it's, it looks like you've been directing uh, everything. Also, the visual. Yes. See. Which is important. Yes. I mean, for me, it's important. It's important I mean, for me when, too. When yeah. We're talking about yeah, I mean, I think of there's the concept, which the the ideas are very simple, usually. A kitchen that only sells food from countries the United States is in conflict with. A museum that has pigeons you can take home. You know, the a radio station that only plays the sound of an extinct bird. Oftentimes, these the concepts are very, very simple, and then what happens gets more complicated. Um, and then the same thing visually. Visually, it's important to me that the story is told quite quickly because they're, 
uh, the works are trying to be seductive to a general public, right? Who's not thinking about art. So um, they need to communicate, like the, the facade of the conflict kitchen. Right, and then you can peel back layers of how people participate or think through it, but uh, one two, two summers ago, two, two years ago, ah, two years. Yeah, or a year and a half ago. Uh, let me show a video. Um, this is where next week we're opening a North Korean version. This is the mock-up of the... Uh, um, this is... Uh, so I went to Shanghai, and in Shanghai, the North Korean government has restaurants that they put into China. They're run by the North Korean government in Shanghai, and they're very bizarre performances of so you're not allowed to take pictures when you walk in the woman's like no photos and then you um you go up and your waitresses after they wait your table they go up and they do a performance for like 45 <laughs> minutes <laughs> musical performance and they're in beautiful gowns and they it's like las vegas meets what's it this is in shanghai china but it's a restaurant that is run by the North Korean government in Shanghai. They actually have it in some other countries as well. It's like this fantasy version. Since there are no, not a lot of restaurants related to a conflict uh, with lands that are in conflict with US. I mean, Cuban restaurant, there was not in, uh, in, uh, in Pittsburgh before, or I, I mean, I never saw it. You have it. Not in Italy. In Italy or in the USA? Yeah. <laughs> Four. <laughs> Five. Six. Seven. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and people at home. So, I mean, was it interesting to me that, for example, North Korea also restaurant is strange to, to mm. think about. Oh, very. The Iranian, Iranian restaurant never seen. I mean, it seems that there is a relationship between uh, restaurant and yeah. uh, peace, I mean, or something like that. In the United States, because since we're an immigrant nation, usually it's different than in Italy. I mean, in Italy, you have, you know, like kebab restaurants and some, you know, but primarily it's Italian food, right? And uh, in the United States, usually the way an immigrant culture introduces itself is through food, is through a restaurant, right? Italians introduce themselves, you know, Chinese, uh, many, cul even cultures that the United States went to war, Vietnam, we have many Vietnamese restaurants because we went to war <laughs> with Vietnam r after the war, yeah. We have some in New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles, there's, y you know, more diversity. There's Iranian restaurants, Cuban restaurants, Venezuelan restaurants. Uh, but in smaller American cities that still have these communities live there, but they don't have a public face, right? They have their 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 identity is not the identity of the city. Yeah, the, I mean, the war seems also a way to be in touch. It's yeah. the, the way America loves the war. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> through war. Yeah, well, we we are a war country. Our economy is built on war. You know, it's there's no doubt about it. So, the the cultural product of that is sometimes surprising. You know, sometimes it puts us in touch with cultures that, through war, it's not a very important way to do it, but it happens. Um, so, th with North Korea, it's ver is most the most difficult country we've tried to communicate with. Cause it's almost impossible. Um, so we went to South Korea because there's people who escape, move to South Korea or China, um, and they're, they escape and they're Korean, but they're third class citizens in South Korea. All right, so Korea for thousands of years was just Korea. For 60 years, the United States and the Soviet Union after World War II split Korea in half, and now North Koreans are like refugees in their own country when they go to the south. Um, so it's it's very fascinating. So we went shopping and cooking and talked about the difference in 
there's like a you know in north and south of italy the food is different because of what history uh agriculture taste but the north of south of america the north and south of many countries same with the north and south of korea but you add politics so you add the fact that there's starvation and that people couldn't have meat you know and they and they become vegetarians because they have to um so many of these stories are stories that we gather and then we tell to the customers in Pittsburgh when they come um let me uh excuse So here's a Is there no sound coming off my computer? I Yeah, it's weird cuz I'm getting this sound. Oops. I think it's my it's my computer is freezing. No, no, this. Oh. Okay. Hold on. No, it's just it's. I think it's me, maybe. No. Huh. Weird. Okay. Well. Yeah, no, I tried it. Yeah. It's uh, strange because in the past. Mm, it's okay because it's in Arabic. We wouldn't understand <laughs> it anyway. <laughs> so they can't. This, it's got English subtitles. Um. It has become more cultured and has international food. So the Al Jazeera Arabic language came to Pittsburgh to do a piece uh, about the conflict kitchen. Uh, 50. So the kitchen, before we were cooking on like like George Foreman grills, which are, George Foreman was a boxer, <laughs> American boxer who made a grill. It's a long story, but... This is before we had the uh, full kitchen. Yes. Now it's good because we have a full kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a Skype live Skype dinner we're between Pittsburgh and Tehran where we have a our dinner table and their dinner table will make the same recipes and have a conversation. Um, this is the staff. They're interviewing customers on the street. I mean, it's... Do you have the um, staff working with you? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very much. So we have 14 people I employ. A chef, um, a co-director, I co-direct it with another artist, Don Waleski, so she and I are the directors. We have a head chef, and then we have um, a manager, and then people who cook, and every... Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. No, yeah. Like these are good questions. It's like something for me. So no, but this is these are the questions we... Do you, um, do you support this project by yourself, or... See, you um, no, through, through the money the restaurant earns. Ah, okay. So right now, we might earn about $400,000, $450,000 a year. It's a lot of money. Uh, it, when we started, we had grants. Uh, I teach at a university, so I was um, renting the space through as like a class. So, But the, the space, the whole waffle shop and conflict kitchen was only $500 a month is the cost yeah, for rent. So I started off, you know, using resources that I already had. So I was a teacher. I was having classes in the city. I convinced the university to give me rent for the classes. Then 
the business started to make money and you know now we make like i said we have about 400 450,000 dollars a year um and do you pay tax for we pay taxes Project. It is a permanent project now. Three years so far. Um, we pay taxes, yeah. And the staff, uh, they... It's a real business. Oh, it's a real business, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this to me is the... <laughs> yeah, you're thinking about this. <laughs> no, so, I mean, I'm, as I told you before, I'm starting a project. Yeah. For the, for me, the I'm facing the, yeah. the issue of the money like si. for using to create this project that yeah. I'm asking all the time. Yeah. It's obviously difficult. Now, we have food, so food makes you money. You have something to sell. You choose the best, I mean, the best uh, An accident, strategy. but it, yeah. Strategy. It is a strategy. It's a strategy, you know, in, it's a strategy that makes money, that brings people yeah and it's a material that tells a story so food is you know it can work there can be other strategies um you know that work as well but it's also for me mo the friction of the project being in the real world being a real business is more powerful that friction is more um i don't know than uh than if it's in an art museum for one month and we set it up and it looks nice and we talk about important things and then it's yeah and then it's gone and it's like <laughs> you know and the cognoscente comes you know it's like uh, who cares i mean you can care it's okay i'm not against political art in museums but to me when things are in the real world there's a greater friction even if it's like the romantic ride in within a swan there's more friction to that um, happening within your life than there is, you know, happening within just an art gallery for me. I sometimes work in art galleries and, you know, I showed, but even when I work in galleries, I try to create a friction. <coughs> so very briefly, I'll show yeah, the Shanghai, the Shanghai yeah. And then, and then other things. Yeah, please. Uh, See. Uh, I can imagine that people now I mean, they, they, they know what to expect when, yeah. they, when they come at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering uh, how the target of uh, the people, that, like, uh, um, of the customers, has mm -hmm. been changi changing in the last years, since uh, people were more aware of what right. happening in the restaurant, and uh, what, uh, if it is creating some sort of division, people do ah. not agree with you or with mm. like uh, mm. uh, like looking at uh, this uh, this count this from mm -hmm. points of view and if so if you are creating some sort of strategies in order to involve more people so yeah the question of so in the old location we were not in a, a city center we we're on the outside of a city and after a while um, the people who would come to the conflict kitchen would know about the conflict kitchen and they would be interested in the conflict kitchen and they'd want to try Afghan food. Some people wouldn't. Some people had no idea. They would just walk by it. And that wasn't working so much for me because it was, it was like, you know, you're interested in conflict kitchen, you come. Well, to me, that the project needs to be in front of people who don't ever think about Afghanistan who've never been to an Afghan restaurant, who are, don't care about art or politics, they're just hungry. And so you can, uh, you know, use it as a decoy. You know what a decoy, yeah. You know, to bring the ducks down so you can <laughs> shoot them all. <laughs> but it's a decoy, you know, a bait and switch. Um, so we moved to a new location in the main piazza in in Pittsburgh. And now we have one to two to three hundred people a day who come and that's been more effective because people who don't think about politics at all show up um, people who do are very interested and then people who disagree with what we say you know you're going to get more of those people um, 
you'd be surprised. Most people, even if they feel like, oh, this is wrong, you know, you shouldn't say good things about Iranians because they're evil. Most people don't say that in the pub. They go online <laughs> to say it, you know. But in public, you know, there's a kind of you know, politeness Some, sometimes. Now, that, that changes. Um, we've told people we're going to be doing a Palestine version, and we have a very large and some uh, Jewish community, some of it very conservative. I'm Jewish, but I'm not conservative. And there are people who have already come up to us and said, how can you do a Palestinian? How can you know? They're savages. They're um, terrorists. Uh, they send their women with bombs strapped to them. And, um, you know, all this, you know, some whatever, very hateful thoughts. And we're like, well, you know, Palestinians are people too. They live within a very difficult situation within Israel. They have a, a culture of their own, etc. We're just... We're not saying what is right and what is wrong. You d you can decide that, but we want to recognize that culture is shared, yeah, and that that's an important and powerful thing. So now they might be they might just want to take a political stance against a uh, a country's policies. Like Iran has nuclear weapons; they're going to bomb Israel. I am against Iranians because of that you know Berlusconi was president what did was he saying what you wanted to say all the time ever you know when George Bush was president of the United States he was not representing my viewpoints so you know we simplify in the United everyone we simplify and we always say at conflict kitchen the idea is to complicate to Yeah. Questions and also recognize its limits, you know. Yeah. But trying to trigger something for me that's the important point of yeah. starting when I deal with art. I'm not going to give any any precise answers. Yeah. I just want to make questions also right. to myself. Yeah. And possibly to the audience that will. I agree. I think the I think all contemporary art or modern art even tries to um, I always think when I talk to my students that you want to make a work that hovers hovers is like it's neither this nor that it's in between and when it's this or it's that it's boring or you're done or it's one line or it's a prank or a joke or a, it's just beautiful it's just this but when it yeah but when it is it could be between more than two things, but let's just say between two things, it's, and this for me in terms of politics, uh, between local and global, between love and hate, between me and you, between, you know, if, I if it can hover, if it can, it, you know, if your idea can exist in between these two, I think that's powerful because it allows us to embrace ambiguity. Um, and that's difficult because the the structure of our brains, you know, the primordial survive as, you know, cavemen was to know danger or friend. That's just, and unfortunately that no longer helps civilization. And so um, can art create a place where those that, Polarity is qu constantly questioned, and the space is opened up. Yeah, it's, you, you got like a very simple structure See. between uh, behind your project, but of course the process it's always ongoing, it's yeah. always uh, in progress. And what I wanted to ask you, uh, okay, this is uh, uh, still happening, but how? Um, like your point of view, like your artistic uh, uh, approach. What, what are you What are you doing with this uh, with this process happening all the time? Are you questioning this process? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to um, to get 
uh, inputs for other projects. And si. I would si. like to know si. how you act behind the scenes. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, because I have to question. The thing I question is whether it becomes this or that obvious or uh, normative, you know, whether it becomes too simple. That's when the project for me, I have to reimagine. So that's what the criteria for making a decision within the project is when it just seems like, uh, I think this is just too obvious. Yeah. That's what yeah, and I think I cha that's a challenge with this project as well. You know, eh, sometimes people might come up and it's just too obvious and it's too clear. And so what strategies can we use to turn it around again? Constant, And that's, it, the longer a project goes, sometimes the harder it is. You know, because when you do something new, it's always the fresh idea. When I come to Italy, everything is like crazy you know everything i see the floors the people everything is like i arrived in a spaceship from another planet and the whole world is unfamiliar again no i've been in italy before but you know what i mean right not italy but china or anywhere yeah and so that is a very powerful uh state of mind i mean as artists we want to create that for other people but you live there for a while the floor becomes the floor the people become the people you no longer see anything you you kind of you tr retreat into your head the world is not surprising anymore and I think the same thing happens within an artwork you know sometimes an artwork is filled with it's like being in another landing on another planet for you right when you make it like, oh, I'm exploring so many new things and I can't see the end of it. Uh, and um, and, I th and for the audience, too, right? That's the most important thing is, right, how does the public experience it? So the, the question of Conflict Kitchen, does the public just start to get bored or expect it? Or I have to try to pay attention to that as well. You know, sometimes... The yeah, the challenge of the... Okay, so the challenge of the new location is we have... 200 people there's a line of people well that's good on one hand but it's bad because then people are just coming quick we can't interact with them you know ah, ciao. Ciao. Um, we can't interact with them about it you know and it, it now forces us you know it's they're just kind of I want food oh I want conflict kitchen give me this and the pace is so quick it forces us to have to think of a new strategies to yeah, it's becoming more an habit, so you need a habit. Yeah. And a very particular type of habit. So uh, it's it's just the speed of engagement. It's faster. So that can be a problem or it could be the mother of invention. Ah, there's a potential there that we could use. Um, that's where, you know, we do this uh, the yeah and in the problem and then find a new way right yeah so so there is a kind of improvisation also. constantly which is the benefit of a project that lasts for a long time is that you can change it and shift it I think the the method in the majority of artistic production is I think I have a process, I produce this thing, I put it into the world, and I step back. You know, from objects to installations to whatever. And here the projects are more a call and response. You know, in some ways more it's, eh, ciao. Um, more like a business, you know. Uh, you know, has to function. You have to respond to your customers. <laughs> Uh, the risk to become easily old or obsolete, you know, it's always yeah. like that about about everything and especially about art, you know. Yeah. My point of view, I'm always worried about the duration of the, of the effect. It just remain a restaurant, makes money. Yeah, it could just be. It could just become a restaurant. Uh, and for 
we're talking about a prod. Do they speak English? See, si. okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, we're talking about a project called Conflict Kitchen, which is a restaurant in the city I live in that sells food from countries the United States is in conflict with. Afghanistan, Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, on a rotating basis. And it's been operating for three years as a business. That's also an art project that uses politics and food. But the question is, right, it could just eventually just be a business, which maybe that's okay, you know? I mean, that's the some criticism, it's not a criticism, but some people will say, well, is it art? anymore? Are you just uh, a capitalist? You know? Um, because, you know, artists love, myself included, sometimes to, you know, we're, we criticize the institutions and capitalism and systems. Now I'm a capitalist. Yeah. I cannot escape. Well, that, yeah. so there's a question, right? You know, there's systems that you can't escape and you can choose to be controlled by them or to reorganize them as uh, as methods that perpetuate, that you can create little moments of autonomy within, right? Or redistribution. So that's a strategy that I think, you know, lots of artists are doing now. Lots of artists are, are functioning, you know, their artworks are now institutions. You know, whether they're fictional or real, they're, they're taking on the identity of, you know, the kind of larger institutional structures to give themselves a kind of parallel power rather than being um, within, constantly within and below subservient to begging to institutions. I think it's going, I mean, it's very much an American phenomenon, um, but I think it's happening you know, worldwide. So? They have big houses, I mean, big studio, they become like school and uh, right. they are system. They are right. System. Yeah. I mean, you see one of the movements within sort of socially engaged art is, is the alternative school, right? That seems to be a very, the past 10, 15 years, lots of people are self organizing to create alternative forms of education. Obviously in Italy it's a very rigid educational structure. Yeah. Yeah, there's both. Um, and so the question in the United States there's much of this. People who are trying to, s part of it is a challenge to the economic structure of education that, um, you know, where does this money go? And, you know, can we create a more immediate relationship between uh, those who teach and those who learn and the environment and the city that we live in. Um, can it be less hierarchical? That's a big one, right? The idea of hierarchy within education and who has knowledge and who doesn't. But I think of that reimagining of a pre-existing structure and creating a parallel alternative structure, which happens everywhere, you know, is a movement that's very strong in art, but it's also very strong in in um, in social networked and online communities, right? The Creative Commons, um, you know, Wikipedia, um, you know, open platforms for more democratic democratic construction of information, and thus information being a sharing of power. And so these, and I talked yesterday. These, I think, are the material that more and more artists are using, right? So, yeah, so you're thinking, oh, can I create a business? Can the project move towards realms that were always like, ah, oh, if you move too close to them, you might not be art or you might slip into something else. To me, that's the friction. It's more powerful to slip into other identities in these projects because then not just the people who show up here who are already interested in art, but the people who are at the cafe across the street will be having, uh, you know, the diagram will overlap. And, uh, you know, and possibly economically, the projects can continue. Yeah, for example, in this, in this um, talking, mm. um, 
I mean, organizing a speech like this could be interesting, I mean, because we share some knowledge, but also sometimes uh, talking about uh, participative uh, actions, mm -hmm. uh, just talking and not doing, mm -hmm. is a bit the same. How do you yeah. think it could be different in mean, organizing this talk? So, I'm an artist, I just make things. <laughs> I talk now, but I have a very different, I'm not a curator, um, although I curate people together for my artwork. I just make things. It's all, I just do. I, it, I just do things and then see how they make sense in the world or not. Um, I have ideas. I don't, I think about them. Yes. But I don't just have discussions and, you know, I... So I'm a very simple person. I just want to see something in the world and then see how... I mean, this, you know, this, we discussed this yesterday. This is the piece the, called The Foreigner. Um, was an idea that I had very quickly and, um, and we, just, we just did it. So the way it works is when you come to the restaurant, we're serving Iranian food. And the host says, would you like to eat your food with someone in Iran? Uh, Sarab, he's in Iran right now. And you're like, well, but I'm in Pittsburgh. You go, no, but you can eat through the body of this local person, Elise. She's going to be a human avatar for Sarab. And so this was an idea that we had very quickly. It's a stupid idea because it's just like this. So the way it works is Elise is right around the corner. She has headphones on. And she is connected through Skype on her phone to Sorab in Iran live. Anything he says, he speaks English. She repeats. Um, and then the customer who sits down and eats lunch, anything they say, Sorab hears in Iran. So the idea is to have a talk with this other who's in another country through the body of someone who's local. Yeah, I, I like this very much. Um, simple. So uh, we could talk about otherness and <laughs> theories and and I don't know if this is a good idea or not you know I mean it's sometimes it's good sometimes it's the technology turns off and people are like ah fuck you know but we did it we had a situation where we could try it out and before that um so this is at conflict kitchen you know it was very effective because there's a context you know that it's Iranian food yeah so we can we have a context that slips you into the conversation. So I'll go show another version of this that was not successful to my mind. It was the first time I tried it. So this is at Conflict Kitchen and So here this is in another city, Cleveland, Ohio. And this is the first time we tried this idea. Um and on the right, so in the upper right is a young Iranian girl and she's live connected to this man who is in Cleveland. And he's in um, a shopping mall. And the same thing on the right is this Iranian man and this, this African-American woman is her, his human avatar. So the, the problem here was, um, and I thought this would be a brilliant idea. So the, the man, he walks around the mall and he comes up to people, right? And he says, hi, how are you? It's just strangers. Um, my name is... Uh, I forget her name, but it's like Bashemi. I'm an Iranian girl. Uh, I'd like to talk to you. And he's obviously, he's a 60-year-old, not Iranian person. And we thought, oh, that would be very interesting. But people were just like, mm, no, thank you. No. Uh, or just very confused. Like, what do you mean? And then he'd have to describe and explain. And by the time he did, the project was like dead and boring. So then we moved to the library, the public library, and tried it in the public library. And the same thing, and then we realized that we just assumed that people would want to talk to him. Like, oh, you meet someone in Iran. But no, it was, di so the thing we changed was, uh, rather than him saying, hi, my name is B Bashemi. I'm a 12-year-old girl in Iran. Um, do you have any questions for me? Which doesn't work. He would start off, just, we'd say, just ask questions this time. Say, ask questions that like, uh, hi, what is, what's the weather like today? You know, simple questions that you should know. And people would be like, oh, and what's it like here in this city? Um, and that helped a little bit because 
you know, it's easy for you to answer questions. But if I say, hey, what do you have to say to me? Do you have questions for me? I live in Iran. It's awkward. So, but the other thing we realized was it was still difficult to do this project without any context for the public. Just coming up to people was just a challenge. So the, the next time we did it, we did it in this museum in San Diego, California. San Diego, California. Same project, uh, The Foreigner. So what happens now is there's a bit of a context that we used. So when you walk up to the museum, there's these signs. And on the left-hand side is the person who lives in San Diego, the avatar. And on the right is Sarab, who lives in Iran. And the museum staff hands you a flyer and says, look for this woman. She'll be sitting in the Persian art gallery. So there's a bit of a context, Persian and Iranian art, right? And you can meet a curator. So the, the staff is kind of giving an introduction, right? Um, and then when you go, you can meet a curator who is living in Iran. Sarab is an art curator. And he's in an exhibition in Iran of contemporary Iranian artwork. So you sit down and the actor is told to, you know, Ah, come, sit down. Do you want to talk? My name is Sorab. I'm in Iran. So they kind of describe it. There's a bit of a context. There's like layers in which you can kind of enter into it. This is, you know, selling food at Conflict Kitchen is very easy. You want an Iranian sandwich? Boom. This is a bit more of a challenge. So this became more effective and people would come and they would sit down and they'd say, oh, you're in Iran. You're in an art gallery. What kind of artwork is there? And he would describe, oh, I'm showing a video of an artist. And you'd have to imagine this space in Iran um, of artwork while you're in a space of ancient Iranian artwork. Again, it's like this simultaneity. It hovers. It's between being in Iran and being in Los Angeles or San Diego, being with an a American and being with an Iranian. So that that... Well, this got a little bit more successful than we when we did it in Cleveland in the mall. Oh, that okay. was very difficult. This was a little better. The best has been when we've done it at Conflict Kitchen because people have a sense of like, ah, it's Iranian food um, and you're asking me to eat with someone in Iran and we can explain it quickly. For some reason, it just works. So it's a simple idea that I could have talked about <laughs> with my friends forever, but we tried it in three different ways rather than just doing it once and being done with it. And we're still wrestling with it. Like, so the, the speech of the swans, where, um, we also, we learned things from that and we took that to Kampla Kitchen. So we print a speech. We asked Iranians to write a speech that they want Barack Obama to do. We, we know Iranians all over the world now. And then we turn that speech into a publication that we hand out to our public and then we turn, We hired someone who looked like Barack Obama and they gave it outside the plaza. So, you know, again, the thing, the project that we discovered in Brazil, what worked, we took the best of, what didn't work, we got rid of and we adopted it for a new context. Um, And now we're continuing it, so now we do a Cuban version. So that's the thing. Now we can. Now our customers kind of are like, "Ah, oh, you're going to do a Cuban <laughs> Barack Obama speech," um, which is nice. That's the thing about the project continuing is people come up to us and make suggestions. You know, they're like, "Hey, can you do? We have an idea for you. You know, you should try this." And we could say no or yes, but. Um, So, uh, maybe, were there any questions? I was just wondering uh, if uh, this would work in another country, of course not with uh, Barack Obama. But yeah, I think so, I think so, possibly, yeah, with even with Barack Obama. Yeah, I think so. Uh, perhaps in Italy. Um, 
Oh, for me. The dynamics. Well, that's why, like in Brazil, I mean, you know, I'm not Brazilian. And when we did the Hugo Chavez and Barack Obama in, in Brazil, it's even though I am not Brazilian, if we give a voice to Brazilians, it's going to represent. A it's not yeah. Like yeah. They're the script writers. Uh, and that way, it's a discovery for me. The process is just a structure in which I learn as opposed to me telling you something I know. I, kn I learned, I mean, for me, early on as an artist, I, I mean, I'm, I know very few things, and I'm not good at many things. I don't draw very well. I'm not, I don't edit video very well. I can't, my Photoshop is rough. My, you know, my ideas are pretty good, but not great. But when I collaborate and work with other people and pull things together, I'm good at that. So I just do what <laughs> I think I'm kind of good at, which is getting out of the way a lot of time uh, and play. I think I'm pretty good at playing with things. Oftentimes the criteria I have for the ideas, this might seem stupid, but is, is it funny? Because I think the funny to, or humor to me represents um, the alien landing on a planet and not knowing how things work. Everything's strange, everything's wrong, <laughs> everything's unusual. And so when something is funny, it's it's kind of like you expect something and then you get something else, right? And I think that's an interesting criteria. Yeah. It's very funny to me that, yeah. So that people would know what they yeah. they they can find inside my restaurant and yeah. they will come because they are familiar with it. Right. While we are doing the other way around. And that's so when people it's interesting now um many social entrepreneur business programs or uh, design and social entrepreneur ask us to speak about our business strategy which is very funny because we're an accidental business. I mean, we're definitely a business. Um, but our strategy is wrong. It, so when we opened the Conflict Kitchen, we did three things that businesses never shouldn't do. One is we opened a business that had no market. So no one had ever had Iranian food. You're going to sell Iranian food all of a sudden? Good luck. Number two, as soon as people get used to it, we're going to close and sell another food that no one knows. And number three, we're going to ask the public to talk about politics. In America, no one talks about politics, maybe in Italy. Um, so those are strategies that are not good business strategies, but you know, strangely, they've actually been effective business strategies for us by being irrational. Um, maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a project right now that I'm thinking about, I, my friend Sorab, who runs this underground art space in Tehran, and it's very difficult because there's many restrictions in Iran on being an artist and what you can say, but he's managed to do it. Uh, so he speaks English very well and has traveled a bit, but he learned English by uh, watching American um, comedies, you know, which many Iranians actually watch on the internet or get DVDs of a so he grew up watching the same television shows that I grew up watching you know these sometimes very bad American comedies so he and I now are doing a project together which is going to be we're going to produce a uh, situation comedy together and film it both in Los Angeles which is where most of the American ones and in Tehran and uh, the idea will be uh, to use humor uh, like what is a sh what is funny to both Iranians and Americans, right? Humor is a very difficult thing because language, ma much humor is about language, play of language, and sometimes that doesn't translate. Um, culture sometimes doesn't translate from one culture to another. So I'm interested in the criteria for this project being where does humor meet and overlap and separate? So the structure of the, if you see this television show that we're going to make, 
um, we're going to make a like a, a domestic environment, like a living room and a kitchen, a set that will be built in Los Angeles, and the same exact set will be built in Tehran. See, there'll be a family that is stuck in two realities at once. It's a little complicated. So it's it's one family, father and a mother and a son and a daughter. Um, they live both in Iran and the United States at the same at the same family <laughs> at the same time. See, so imagine uh, the mother and the the daughter are arguing about the daughter is uh, dating someone who is Arab, and Iranians historically don't consider themselves Arab; they consider themselves Persian. And so, dating an Arab is something you would not do. It's not you know okay. The same thing for many Americans dating someone who is Arab. You know, there's a lot of prejudice. So. The Iranian mother and daughter are talking, say, about dating an Arab, and they're fighting about it in Farsi, in Persian. And then the daughter walks into the kitchen, and all of a sudden, she's a different actress playing the same person, speaking English. And the, the conversation now gets turned into, taken into an American environment. Looks like the same kitchen and back and forth and back and forth. So the idea of using, number one, like comedy and television and family, things that are very um, safe and, a not, and humor. But what we're going to try to do is talk about things that are kind of dangerous or... Well, that's what we're trying to develop, yeah, is what is the strategy? Do we go back and forth between Iran and, and uh, Los Angeles? Or do we work at the same time? Um, so, but the, this is the basic idea. I don't know what the, pre so there's the idea. I talk, right now, no, I'm going to, I'm going to make it happen. Yeah, because I'm an artist. <laughs> it's, that's all I know is to do it. And it'll change. Yeah, it'll definitely change once we make it happen. So, but it's the opportunity to think about number one, this can, we, we'll put it online. So in Iran, p anyone in Iran can view it. And it'll be in Farsi, they'll be, they'll be speaking Farsi or Farsi subtitles. Um, and in the United States, the, our idea is to take it to TV executives and see if they'll turn it into an actual show. And if they don't, we'll still publish it. Um, so, and this kind of all came out of the conflict kitchen, you know, the relationships I made and, um, and maybe we'll turn it, bring it back to the conflict kitchen. So the nice thing is the, the project has a f made opportunities to develop satellite, you know, relationships. Um, we're doing a project right now in South Korea with North Korean refugees. Um, in Korea is a mountainous country. All There's mountains all over Korea, and all their myths and stories are about gods from the mountains. All the Korean people came from these mountain spirits. Um, and historically, Koreans uh, would go to the mountains for uh, to pray in Buddhist you know, sanctuaries. Um, they'd also use the mountains to forage for food, for flowers and plants and mushrooms for... Elixirs, elixirs, see, uh, medicinal herbs, and um, and in South Korea, which you know is a capitalist country, they have now that people hike, like the the biggest pastime is go to the mountains and and hike. In North Korea, the mountains um, have a very different identity now because of politics. People have taken all the wood for fuel. They've taken all the grass, anything that could be eaten, they've taken. No one has the time to go and just take a hike. So mountains have a different psychic identity. So we're doing this project in South Korea where North Korean uh, refugees will be going on hikes with South Koreans um, and talking about their experience, again, like kind of lapping their experience of North Korea with the Southern South Korea and then, then they come down, they share this medicinal drink together. Um, so again, that project came out of the research that Conflict Kitchen was doing 
you know, invited to there to North Korea. Um, and thus one project just kind of links to another. So that one, the television one, I'm trying to raise the money. So we're going to different organizations, uh, some that fund uh, United States like diplomatic and cultural exchange, um, some that fund Iranian culture, some that fund art in the United States, um, my own university, I'm writing a grant. I mean, I feel like I could do the project. I teach art. I teach this type of art. Um, but I feel like I could do the project for maybe $10,000 very cheaply. We could do a very cheap version for $10,000. But probably I'd like to get forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 to be able to do it. And if I got $100,000, we'd do it better but there's so but i in all my projects i think of like what's the hundred thousand dollar version the fifty thousand dollars the ten thousand or the zero you know i mean i've done i did a project i have not talked about but with no in with iranian so i did a project for nothing that <coughs> seven years ago with I, this is the first project i did about iran with a, another curator andrea grover and essentially what it was, um, was just online, but it was shown in six different galleries and museums. So what we did is we asked people in different countries for two months, if you would participate, so you say you're a participant, every day you have to take a photograph in your hometown, say in Bari, of what you imagined Tehran to look like. So you've never been, it, the project is called Never Been to Tehran. <laughs> so you can't have ever been to Tehran. So you don't know what it looks like. <laughs> maybe you go online, maybe you've heard about it, but you need to take a photograph in Bari that, that you think looks like Tehran. Yeah, so you have to think every, day. every day you've got to take a photograph. So the idea is to, number one, admit, I don't know. I'm going to get this wrong. And number two, try to be empathic. Try to find somewhere else, right where you live. And then you upload that photograph to um, like Flickr, you know, just an online photo sharing. And then you and the 20 other people around the world upload their photographs every day. So uh, we had someone in uh, uh, Elena Perlino. Uh, we had an Italian artist, I forget who took photos. I forget where she was, but um, and in you know in Japan, in Denmark, in United States, in different places, and then the exhibit. So it, that's very cheap. Yeah, you take a photograph, and then for the exhibition, all they need to do is plug in their. This is the exhibition. <laughs> you plug in your computer, you put it up the Flickr, and it goes on slideshow, and it, and it's in Iran. So in, a, in an art space in Iran, they get to see all these bizarre images of how people think Iran looks by taking photos in their home. So it's a good way for artists who could never travel to Iran to have an exhibition in Iran, right? About Iran, but it's really about where they live. Um, but then we did it in New Zealand. Any art space could. Um, and so that project we did with no money. Uh, but in some ways, it was a very complicated global uh, exhibition. So I want to show some things that, not that I did, but maybe just for conversation. I'm okay, but I'm okay. But if they need a break. 